So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. My name is Neve King. I'm the Vice President for Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and we're delighted that you're here. Um, first thing, could you turn off your phones or your Blackberries, please? Anything that might make a noise or interrupt the program. Um, we'd like to thank Goldman Sachs for their support of the program this morning, particularly our board member Bruce Heyman and Alan Ginsberg, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, as many of you know, we're in the we're in the final lap of getting towards the NATO summits in Chicago, and um, we've had our In Jeopardy program, and the last program of that is coming up next week when we're hosting Madeleine Albright. She'll be here. She's the honorary co-chair of the host committee of the summit, so she'll have a lot of interesting things to say. Um, we also are announcing this Friday our package where we will be hosting a lot of the world leaders that are coming to Chicago, including but not limited to the president of Turkey, the um, Polish foreign minister, the Dutch prime minister, we know there's been some changes in the government, but he's still coming, um, Catherine, Baroness Ashton, and uh, several others, the Czech president as well too. So stay tuned, you'll get a big email on Friday, and if you're not on our mailing list, just ask my colleagues or me and we can add you to that so you can be aware of all the great stuff going on around the summits. Also, a couple of other corporate programs. We'll be welcoming the United States Air Force Secretary in May, and also Alessandro Pio, the Director General of the Asian Development Bank, talking about Asia 2050, one of their new reports, and Jim Rickards way back talking about currency. Um, now I'd like to welcome to the stage Alan, Adam Ginsberg. We've been working with him on this program, so thanks for your help. He's the Vice President for Private Wealth Management at Goldman Sachs. Thank you. Thank you, Neve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Adam Ginsberg from the Private Wealth Management Division of, Go of Goldman Sachs. On behalf of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this morning's corporate program. Goldman Sachs is pleased to support this important discussion today with Jim O'Neill on the BRICS and beyond. Over the past 10 years, we've experienced a remarkable transformation of the global economic landscape. This has been led in no small part by the rapid development of the BRICS. Recently, Sri Mulyani Indrawati of the World Bank addressed the Council on the need for the BRICS and other middle-income countries to some greater, greater global responsibilities as a result of their economic successes and the increasingly important role they will continue to play in the global economy. Today, Jim O'Neill, who coined the term BRICS 10 years ago, will continue the conversation and speak about the outlook for economic growth in the BRICS and about the prospects for the next generation of nations that may play a transformative role in the global economy. Following Jim's remarks, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A session, as well as purchase copies of Jim's new book, The Growth Map. You've all received a full biography of Jim, but please let me briefly introduce him to you. Jim O'Neill joined Goldman Sachs in 1995 and is currently the chairman of Goldman Sachs Asset Management and serves on the European Management Committee. Jim is a member of the UK India Roundtable and the UK India Business Council. Jim is chairman and one of the founding trustees of the London-based charity Shine and serves on the board of a number of charities specializing in education. Jim previously served as the non-executive director of Manchester United and I assure you no one is more excited about Monday's game against Manchester City than Jim O'Neill for the for the soccer fans in the room. Finally, Jim holds a degree from Sheffield University and a PhD from the University of Surrey. Please join me in welcoming the Chicago Council, Jim O'Neill. Uh, good morning, Adam. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. It is uh, extremely nice to be here in Chicago. Um, as somebody that originates from Manchester, I've been trained to believe that uh, Chicago is the Manchester uh, of the United States in our Manchester's relationship with London. So I immediately have affinity every time I come here, whether that is true or not. Uh, and it's nice to be here. I was just uh, thinking as I was listening to that introduction that I have had the pleasure uh, of being in this room before. I can't remember it. I think it would be about three years or so ago. So. Uh, aspects of those of you that may have been here, uh, aspects of what I touch on will, 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 will um, be not entirely new to some of you, although I'll try to keep my formal comments to matters highly topical. Uh, I also have to, I cannot resist uh, uh, the uh, obvious temptation to uh, wish you all the best with your summits that you have coming up. We have uh, something somewhat different coming up in London in the summer, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, and I just hope for you guys that you aren't being freaked out by the local media in the same way that any citizen of London is about the uh, utter chaos that everybody's predicting for weeks on end. Uh, 
uh, for some reason, both before and after the Olympics have actually finished, but there you go. Uh, so I, I thought what I'd do is um, perhaps try to just use some of the slides to talk for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and especially with it being so early in the morning, I can't believe such an audience at, at such an early hour. Uh, to keep everybody uh, alive, I'll try to uh, give as much time as possible for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, but I thought I'd, I'd uh, take the risk by starting off by, by highlighting uh, what I, I would say is the, uh, the, 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 the most interesting theme of the week in terms of at least uh, the way the world is integrated. Uh, I, I arrived uh, in New York late uh, Tuesday and I spent a day there at a, a very important Goldman Sachs Asset Management Conference and I arrived here last night and I, I apologise, this theme has sort of been, I, I sort of often catch on to little themes and uh, they become a bit of an obsession of mine for a few days so I get bored of them and move on to something else. So let me start by saying, how many of you own stock in Apple? Oh, that's not that many, it's about 25% of you. So, did any of you know three days ago that you were essentially making a huge, enormous bet on China? Because the theme of the week, and in my judgment, uh, an extraordinary uh, development that uh, certainly people in Washington need to pay uh, rather a bit of attention to, and if I uh, do we have media present before I start getting into my normal bluntness? Are we on or off the record? On the record, okay. I just, it's good that I asked that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that some people close to that rather famous political figure that originates from this great city <laughs> need to think a bit about those Apple results too, because of uh, the astonishing facts uh, that twen Apple already is deriving 20% of its revenue from China, uh, which is really, even for somebody like me, is quite remarkable. Uh, but anybody that thinks we cannot benefit from the rise of China in the West needs to take a very good look uh, at that remarkable quarterly earnings result from Apple. Uh, and with that, I guess that the sort of, I, I also uh, believe that I'm following in the uh, very close footsteps of uh, two rather prestigious figures, Martin Wolf and Chris Patton, so uh, that makes it rather daunting too. Uh, but in saying that, I will uh, immediately follow it with the risk of saying, one of the things that I find so uh, intellectually, at least, stimulating about the world uh, these days, and one of the things that I love about my job is that it's, it's really difficult for people to understand the world, uh, especially people from my generation. Uh, I, I often find it perhaps slightly oddly, or, or, or actually with enthusiasm, that younger people seem to get a grasp as to how the world is changing more than people from my generation. Uh, and dare I say it, uh, that may include those two illustrious people you've just had through here. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll start by actually showing you this picture. Can you, can you, can you see clearly at the back? Um, that means that you all have much better eyesight than I do, because if I was sitting at the back, I would be really <laughs> struggling. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, about uh, a year ago, a bit longer actually, after a, a very long trip I was on uh, to China, India, and South Korea, uh, it was about a two-week trip, but even for some like myself that travels frequently, that was quite a long trip. Uh, I noticed David Hale here, one of the few human beings in the world that I think probably travels more than I do to do with international economic matters, but for me that was a long trip. Um, and, and as uh, I'm sure David experiences, and many of you, when you go on such long trips, particularly with different time zones, and you're travelling home, and you're sort of reflecting on life, and, and I, I, I thought to myself, particularly influenced, oddly, by uh, my brief time in South Korea, the, on the back of being in the other two, that even myself as Mr. Brick, so to speak, uh, I didn't think I 
I fully appreciated the scale at which both those countries uh, are starting to influence the whole world. Uh, and being in somewhere like South Korea um, yeah, is a, in itself a very interesting uh, experience, particularly for those that have been visiting somewhere like South Korea for uh, 20 to 30 years. And I'm going to come back to talk about South Korea. Uh, because South Korea manages to adjust uh, to the changing dynamics of the world in a rather impressive way, in my opinion. And, it, and all of that led me to be thinking, it really is quite ridiculous that we still think of some of these countries as standard um, emerging economies. And with reference to, uh, to the book that Adam mentioned, um, uh, because it was around about the 10 year anniversary uh, on the horizon, I decided after, after many years of resisting the temptation to actually try and write a book so I could put it into uh, less sort of economic speak as to the, as to the scale of it, and that's what the, the growth map thing is all about. Let me, sorry, I should also add, um, uh, none of the, if any of you are contemplating buying the book, none of the proceeds are going to myself as a far too privileged Goldman Sachs banker, it's all going to uh, shine the educational charity which I help find, so I just thought I'd make that clear. Um, and so I decided that we need to find a, a better word for some of these countries, and that led to me uh, thinking of calling them uh, the growth economies to distinguish uh, some of them from other nations that I think probably should still be regarded as emerging markets. And this uh, blue, as a long-winded way of saying, this blue um, pie chart you can see here with eight countries, the four BRIC countries uh, and four of the so-called next 11. Uh, I believe each of those uh, have become sufficiently uh, important in terms of the world economy that we shouldn't think of them uh, as traditional emerging economies. Uh, and as I'll come back to say in particular about South Korea, it's really quite preposterous, uh, in my opinion, that people still think of somewhere like that, uh, which is now a reasonably high income country as an emerging market. It's kind of ridiculous. And, uh, if you take uh, those eight and put them back into the left-hand pie chart, uh, that's sort of how I think of the world. Um, and I don't think many people of my generation, um, including those that follow a lot of Western economies in great detail, uh, actually fully appreciate the scale at which things uh, continue to change. And I'll follow that up uh, immediately by uh, a couple of you that I was chatting to over, over coffee before already raised issues about Europe with me, but to, 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 to follow that through and to put it in the context of the never-ending minute-by-minute uh, focus on the remarkable drama known as European Monetary Union, uh, this simple picture is, is, a, is an attempt to show you why I think these countries are having uh, a bigger impact on the world than still many people realise, including, by the way, vast numbers of our Western policymakers. So at the top, uh, particularly if you have a magnifying glass, uh, you will see the Greek economy. Uh, it is only $300 billion. Um, as I travel around the world, uh, one of the biggest questions or I always get is about Greece. Uh, and as I'll now, apologies to those of you uh, who are Greek or Greek ancestry, it's nothing personal, uh, but in a global economic context, context, the only relevance of Greece is what, if any, contagion there is from that country's troubles to other countries uh, in the European military system uh, or beyond, because economically, uh, as this table, uh, sorry, this picture sort of shows, and the way I love to paraphrase it these days, China creates the economic equivalent of another Greece every 11 and a half weeks. <clears throat> Last year, the change in the dollar value of China's GDP in that one year uh, was over $1.1 $1 trillion. So literally, China is creating the economic equivalent uh, of another Greece uh, uh, every 11 and a half weeks. In the same sort of context, uh, it's creating another Spain uh, every 15 months. 
uh, and Spain is quite a large economy. Uh, and to, to continue with the same sort of context, last year the change in the aggregate dollar value of the four BRIC economies collectively uh, was just uh, was between 2.1 and 2.2 trillion dollars. Or to put it again in the context of the current European crisis, in one year the change in their collected GDP was close to the size the size of Italy which is the, is the eighth, currently the eighth largest economy in the world, and so Italy is something that really matters. But these guys are creating, at the moment, the equivalent of another Italy uh, every 15 months. Uh, and, and that is the scale uh, at which the world is currently evolving. And why uh, the kind of thing we saw with Apple uh, the past couple of days is not actually a rare phenomenon. Um, and then to put it in the context of the decade as a whole, uh, this is a, a simple picture of showing you the, the change in the dollar value of GDP uh, that we are assuming uh, for the whole of this decade. And let me emphasize that this assumes relatively uh, conservative GDP growth rates uh, for many of these countries. <clears throat> in the case of China, for example, uh, assuming that China grows on average by 8%, uh, India by 7 Russia and Brazil by 4 uh, the other growth economies, uh, I think Indonesia is the highest of them, about 6 uh, and the others uh, between 4 and 6 And let me uh, attract your attention to uh, four things which I think are particularly important in the context of the world evolving dramatically in the speed at which it is. If you look at the uh, aggregate of the growth of eight economies collectively, uh, we are assuming a $15 trillion change, and that's in current, current dollars. Uh, about 80% uh, of that will be from the four BRIC countries. <coughs> The second thing to point out, half of that uh, is China itself. Uh, there, there are many days of the week where I receive all sorts of uh, rather colourful emails relating to the whole big theme. Uh, frequently advice from many people I've never met that I should consider dropping the R in brick or adding another I for Indonesia, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, and the more I creep through time, I, I find myself thinking if there is a particular odd uh, one of the four in it, it's actually the C, because China is just on its own increasingly so important. Chinese economy today is the same size as the other three put together. And in fact, if I, uh, if I go, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. If I, I were to go back to this chart, I could have actually had uh, the level of India's GDP on there, and China is not far off uh, creating another India every 18 months. So when people talk about the whole sort of game of which one's going to eventually win, China versus India, uh, if that were a 100 meter uh, Olympic sprint race, it would be a bit like me versus uh, Usain Bolt. Ra rather unfair comparison. Um, so China, with 8% growth, is half of that. Um, but the most important thing in the context of the changing world, if you look closely, the growth aid collectively on these numbers uh, will contribute more than double the, co the combined change in the GDP of the US and Europe put together. More than double. And China alone will contribute more than the US and Europe put together. For all those that think Russia uh, is a basket case and the R shouldn't be in brick, Russia on its own will see its dollar GDP change by pretty much close to the aggregate amount of the euro area. And this, all, all that is needed for that to happen is to, for Russia to grow by about 4%. So we might not like them, but to think of that meaning therefore we should ignore them economically is really uh, not very sensible. A um, few more pictures. 
Here is what uh, the share of uh, global GDP would be look like um, if, if what I just showed you happens. Uh, and I want to focus on two aspects of this really. Uh, the G7 would still be collectively uh, the largest grouping as such, uh, but in the context of the BRICS political leaders uh, meetings, which are becoming more and more prominent, and the whole debate about global economic governance, in my judgment, there is no way that it can continue to be uh, how it is right now, uh, because within the next three years, the combined uh, size of the BRIC countries will become bigger than the United States. Unless China is right now in the early stages of experiencing a hard landing, as is popularly debated in the markets, the four BRIC countries are going to be bigger than the US, uh, probably by 2015, possibly by 2014. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, as complicated, and I think it is very complicated, as complicated as it is, it is only appropriate that they have a much bigger weight uh, and say uh, in the governance of our complicated world. Uh, and in that uh, context, I think the days uh, of some sort of cosy arrangements between Europe and uh, Washington about appointing the heads of the IMF uh, and the World Bank are very close uh, to an end. And we saw uh, some aspects of that over the uh, recent uh, decisions about the, the new head of the World Bank. <clears throat> uh, the second thing in that context, uh, and probably ultimately, ultimately more important than the role of any individuals, uh, is how the whole global monetary system will evolve. Uh, and I suspect uh, that China, uh, as, as they have done in the past uh, fortnight, will now probably accelerate uh, the pace of financial market reform. Uh, and certainly will, in my judgment, do sufficient for the RMB to become part of the SDR, so-called SDR basket uh, by 2015, uh, something which may actually allow uh, the Russian ruble, controversially perhaps, to become part of it as well. Uh, and that will lead to uh, increasing debates, very complex debates, about whether we will be uh, moving into a monetary era where the dollar has to share more some of its role uh, as the dominant reserve currency and uh, the possibility, and I certainly think it will, it will be alive for some time, uh, that some of the BRIC countries, will, particularly the Chinese, will try to promote the idea uh, that perhaps the SDR could be itself uh, an anchor currency in some kind of future global monetary affairs. Very, very complex. Um, mindful of the time and wanting to keep it for questions, so I'll perhaps just show you uh, another three or four pictures for now and then use some others perhaps to answer questions. Um, I said at the start that I was highly influenced um, on, a, on a trip to South Korea uh, in terms of writing the book and thinking about how the world evolves and what we all need to do. Uh, we, we, or my old department, the economics department at Goldman Sachs, for, for many years uh, have, have constructed something that we call a growth environment score, uh, which is an index uh, of productivity, uh, or an index of various variables that drive sustainable growth and productivity. Uh, and this is uh, the latest ones that you can see for the four BRIC countries and the next 11 largest populated uh, emerging economies. About three quarters of the world's population, or between two thirds to three quarters of the world's population live in these 15 countries. Uh, and it's an index that goes from zero to 10. These days it includes uh, 18 different variables. Uh, 10 is Manchester United, zero is Manchester City. <laughs> or at least I hope so ahead of Monday. Um, and uh, what is increasingly fascinating to me about somewhere like South Korea, we, we, my old guys do this for 183 countries. South Korea is the fourth highest scoring country in the world, bigger than you guys. South Korea's score is better than every G7 country. And yet, we talk about it as an emerging economy. 
South Korea is the one country in my professional career that I'm aware of, at least with a large number of people, that has successfully transformed itself from a very low income country uh, to one that's not that far behind our living standards. And in that context, as I often say when I'm talking to policymakers from any one of these other 15 countries about what they should do, uh, copy South Korea. Because if those other countries can do things to get all these variables that relate to such a, a scoring system to South Korea's level, uh, then they will have a very prosperous future. As I'm sure those of you that have studied uh, international economic history, 30 odd years ago, many countries in Africa had the same level of wealth as South Korea. And so if they want to get that back, and uh, I'm in the camp that believes this is uh, potentially a very exciting moment for that continent, they have to do things which has allowed South Korea to do so well. Uh, here, I am sure you will not be able to see uh, from the back. Uh, you might not even be able to see that clearly near the front, so I apologize. These are all the 18 different variables that are relevant for this thing. Uh, and I show it here for the eight so-called growth market economies, uh, and uh, by way of comparison, the United States at the end. Uh, and you can see where countries do well and countries do not so well. And there's a whole uh, area where, uh, particularly in terms of uh, uh, one thing that I think really highlighted, in terms of the use of modern technology, South Korea is absolutely fantastic, uh, which is, along with globalization in my judgment, at the heart of why so many of these countries are doing so well, Hi highly relevant uh, in the context of Africa. Um, so let me uh, jump forward uh, and show you three other pictures, then I'll stop. In many ways, this is the most important one, uh, linked to what we've just seen from Apple. This is a picture of what I call global shopping. It is uh, retail sales uh, adjusted for inflation all over the world. And what, the reason why I think it is so difficult for people of my generation to understand how the world's changing, it, it, is, it is like the world turned upside down from the world in which uh, I was professionally brought into. Because the red line is the world, and the blue line is consumer spending and growth and emerging markets. And if this carries on at this pace, by the end of the decade, the dollar value of consumption in the eight growth economies is going to be bigger than the US. And you see in the likes of evidence that Apple's just reported, it's happening today. Uh, and everywhere I travel, around the world, uh, including in particularly uh, um, fashionable western urban uh, cities or areas, you see evidence of it all the while. I was at a, a very interesting uh, economic session in Italy about three weeks ago and I flew out of Malpensa Airport, which I guess is where you guys are probably flying in and out of. Uh, those of you that ever go there, uh, you'll probably see you next time. <coughs> Uh, the same as I did when I was leaving, I, uh, because I was a permanent state of jet lag, I, I, I for a few moments thought I actually was at an airport terminal in Hong Kong. Because when I went through the duty free areas and walked through all the shops, it was literally full of Chinese people uh, buying things at Malpensa. Uh, one of my favourite anecdotes that I think I'm actually put into the book uh, last summer I went walking uh, with my wife for a few days in the Swiss Alps. Uh, and any of you that know the French-speaking side, we were staying in a, a, a village called Les Diables. My apologies to the French-speaking of you, I'm sure that pronunciation's not right. Uh, and we, one day we were going up uh, for a walk and we came across a ski lift at about, uh, I think it was about 1,000 metres, uh, and it could take you up to uh, 3,000 <coughs> uh, at the top. Um, and for the privilege of doing that, it would cost you, if I remember rightly, 74 Swiss francs. Uh, and as those of you involved in the foreign exchange market know, right now, that's rather a large amount of money. It was even more then before the Swiss National Bank decided to try and uh, reverse the Swiss francs' remarkable strength. And uh, we, we had lived in Switzerland briefly uh, in days, in pre goldman days when I worked for the one and only SBC, which had uh, some relevance for this city in the past, of course. Um, 
Um, so we know Switzerland quite well, and we were busy de arguing about whether it was worth it. Those of you who know Switzerland in the summer, uh, when you get to 3,000 feet, any, anything around midday, you can't see anything anyhow because it's so hot and humid and all you see is clouds. So we were having this debate, my, my wife often says that you know, she lives in the real world and I live in some kind of cloud cuckoo land, and so we're not doing it. And then just as we were busy arguing, some Indian guy uh, walked past us, got out five 100 Swiss franc notes, and said, six people, please. Didn't bat an eyelid at the price. Got his family, got on the ski lift, and off he went. So I said to my wife, we are going up there. <laughs> and I kid you not, when we got to the top, it was, it was literally as though we were in the middle of Mumbai. It was full of uh, seemingly wealthy Indians, uh, filling out their Bollywood fantasies in the beautiful Swiss Alps. And that's the sort of thing that's going on in the world. Um, I can't finish without uh, some reference to the never-ending topic of European Monetary Union. And I, I like to do uh, a little bit of a game. As to, in, in, in a world where anyone uh, could pretend that they were in Europe and join European Monetary Union, uh, Here's a further sign of, 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 of why the world is so kind of uh, remarkably changing. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with the so-called Maastricht Treaty? Oh, a lot of, more of you are familiar with that than own Apple stock. But that's a sign of the depth of intelligence in uh, Chicago. So, those of you that don't, let me just point out that amongst the three criteria were, were two that relate to fiscal policy. Countries were supposed to have uh, a deficit of GDP of 3% or less, and rather hilariously in saying this, they were supposed to also uh, have a debt to GDP of 60% or less or heading in that direction. I show on the last column there the so-called growth environment score. So if you did this little game right now with respect to people who are in European Monetary Union and applied it vigorously, there would only be actually three countries inside EMU. Finland, Slovakia, if you were being uh, a little bit generous on the, on the uh, deficit, and Slovenia. That would be one weird European Monetary Union. <laughs> Even Germany, to, to borrow a Sir Alex Ferguson football analogy about the noisy neighbours. Germany, the rather noisy neighbour, wouldn't actually qualify either. And yet here it is telling everybody what to do. If you extended that uh, analogy to the whole of the so-called developed world, you wouldn't be able to find many others either. And of course, highly topical in the to context of the US, probably post-election. Uh, the US's fiscal position is actually worse than the average of the European Union, uh, which I don't have time to get into it now, but that in itself tells me that this is not really a European fiscal crisis. This is a crisis, it's even worse. It's a crisis about uh, the structure, the governance, the leadership, and possibly the existence of European Monetary Union. It is not really a fiscal crisis, because most other developed parts of the world's fiscal position is worse than the average of Europe's. And if it's a fiscal crisis, how come everybody else's bond yields aren't going through the roof as well? But if you carried on this game, the only other countries that could join would be Australia, Sweden, Norway, and Switzerland. So you have a pretty strange European monetary union. If my friends from the growth markets were daft enough to want to emigrate to Europe, Six of them would walk in it tomorrow. They are more Swiss than the Swiss when it comes to their current fiscal position. Uh, apologies to the Indians for making this joke, but India might have to consider going into a European Monetary Union with Club Med. But the rest would be able to stand up there with the Germans and say, you don't tell us anything because our fiscal position is as good, if not better, than yours. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the scale of the changes going on out there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. We'd like to go out to the audience now, so if you could just raise your arm and wait for a microphone, and we'll start right over here, please, in the third row.
Yeah, one second, there's just a mic coming, thanks. And in the front there. Your French is very good. Um, <laughs> what, what could be the impact of Sarkozy losing the election next week? What could be the impact of Sarkozy losing the election? Um, I'm not, in the very short term, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, markets, markets can be guilty of a lot of things a lot of the time, but they're reasonably good at discounting what appear to be high probability events. And the opinion polls uh, have suggested uh, for quite some time that Sarkozy will lose. Um, and I think that's perhaps partly why in the past fortnight uh, the European markets have become so unstable again, because uh, people are building in uh, a high probability that Sarkozy will lose. One, one of the reasons I say uh, I'm not sure, uh, because it's not entirely clear to me um, that even if Sarkozy won, um, the future core uh, issues about Euro European Monetary Union would be as uh, simple as is generally fashionably discussed in the markets. Um, I, I'm of the camp that believes, <coughs> at least in principle, German policymakers have a quite clear medium to long-term goal of where they want EMU to go, which is some sort of version of the United States of Europe. In fact, I find myself often thinking large parts of the past two years uh, have helped German policymakers uh, rediscover their enthusiasm for the sort of EMU that they all kind of wanted before it started. Um, whether we can get there or not because of the complexity of the issues, I don't know, but uh, the reason why I say this in the context of the French election in Sarkozy is it's not the version of EMU that France really wants. And uh, Sarkozy is part of that camp. Uh, and at least ideologically, I suspect Holland and those close to him might be a bit more sympathetic for that sort of notion of a, of a future long-term path. <coughs> Um, so it's very, as with everything else with this never-ending topic, it is idiotically complex and uh, there, are, there are just no simple, easy ways of looking at it or thinking for easy solutions in my opinion. Uh, it certainly suggests, uh, if Sarkozy's gone, that the simplicity surrounding the so-called fiscal compacts uh, is gone. I, I, I found myself within days of it being formally agreed, actually rather rudely describing it as fiscal compost in any case, because it strikes me as though it's not, it's not really going to the core issues uh, about the whole, whole future of EMU. Uh, and not surprisingly, we see already uh, many countries not wanting to, to live uh, by it, certainly not the detail, uh, and in some cases not the spirit, and, and certainly Holland will not. Uh, in, in that context, the, the big news, in my opinion, in Europe the past week is, is not the fact markets are now focusing on this, it's, it's coincidentally at the same time, uh, as even a country as conservatively physically as the Dutch have, have essentially said that they're not going to go along uh, with what the fiscal compact requires. So uh, we have another co very complex uh, state of affairs sort of just appeared out of the blue, really. Um, but I think the markets expect Holland to win. Yeah, right over here, please, in the second row. Ram Kalkar with Milliman. Uh, my question is about China. I, on the chart that you put up, I noticed that the political stability had a 4.5 number, which is actually higher than Brazil's, especially given what's happening with the bow situation <laughs> right now. And looking forward, do you think that's still the case, and do you think China could do the transformation that South Korea did from being an authoritarian regime to a more democratic regime? Wow, that is a very, that, that in some ways is the one trillion dollar question. Uh, when I think about uh, the long term issues for China, 
uh, as with some of the others, sort of trying to do things that South Korea has done is applicable. Uh, and I have always assumed that the style of governance that China uh, <coughs> undertakes will itself evolve through time. And this, this may be a really important moment. Um, last week, uh, I had the privilege of being with a very small group uh, invited to meet with one of the current top uh, members of the, uh, the Politburo in London. And it, it was quite possibly the most interesting meeting I've ever been at with a Chinese policymaker. Um, not least because it, it, it went on about an hour longer than it was planned to be. And, and at least half of the reason for that was this person uh, making it rather bluntly clear that they do not think it is appropriate for other countries around the world to lecture them on human rights, uh, particularly uh, the one that I come from, the United Kingdom. Uh, and we're all reminded in great detail uh, about uh, some of the past history of Hong Kong and opium wars and so on, which was quite remarkable. Um, but, and then in addition, uh, he spent a lot of time talking about uh, what they want in terms of the medium term uh, goals as, as represented by the five year plan. Uh, and uh, he highlighted five things, uh, I'll mention them, because one of them was particularly particularly surprising and quite encouraging. Um, I always expect when I, I meet a senior Chinese policymaker that the first thing they will highlight is social stability, or the, as they often uh, translate it into English, social harmony. Uh, his number one uh, reference to the five-year plan's goals was innovation. I was really surprised. Uh, I was really surprised, and this is coming from a very senior uh, followed by uh, uh, a greater uh, equality of wealth, that's number two. Uh, three, a better balance of the economy, uh, albeit, and he reminded us in that context that the five year plan assumed 7% growth. Uh, and it reminds me to say in that regard when the markets about four weeks ago also appeared to be surprised when Premier Wen said that they were targeting 7.5% growth this year. I, I don't really understand why people were surprised by that. They, they told us already a year ago in the five year plan that they were assuming 7. Uh, and he elaborated at great length that they have entered a phase of focusing more on what I'd say is the quality of growth rather than the quantity. Uh, the fourth thing in that context was all about uh, much greater energy efficiency and use of alternative energies. And then finally, social harmony did get a mention, uh, but it was, it was mentioned as the fifth as opposed to the first. Um, and I think, um, without getting into the gory detail and remarkable rumours that appear to fly around the web about what's happened uh, with that particular gentleman from Chongqing. Um, I think the reformers have used this, from what I can read and, and, and decipher, as, a, as an excuse to accelerate reforms. Uh, and I think um, until I see any evidence of the difference, that's the, that's the presumption that I'm making. Okay, next question. Yeah, Nora, the gentleman sitting right next, sitting right next to you. There, thanks. Thanks, Jim, for sharing your view about the importance of a break and China in particular. My question along the way is, what's your view about R&D and nationalization of Sorry, your mic's not working. Could we, we'll just get a different I, I, I mic. Heard, I, I'll repeat the questions. What do I think about R&D and nationalization? Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, as I said briefly in my comments, um, I, I'm assuming that there will be quite significant further uh, deregulation and opening up of uh, um, capital markets and cross-border flows uh, sufficiently to result in the RMB becoming part of the SDR baskets by 2015. 
Um, two, two things to add in that context. It is, it is extremely interesting to have read, at least, I've seen it twice, maybe he's done it more, but the, the governor of uh, the central bank, the PBOC, has two times, to my knowledge, this year already, uh, highlighted that, in his judgment, China is close to fulfilling most of the criteria, most of the criteria under the official uh, IMF definitions, with a plural, uh, for convertibility. Uh, and he, he emphasized uh, Chinese style, uh, which is very intriguing. Uh, I also happened to be at another meeting in London last week where there was a senior representative from the PBOB present. Uh, and uh, I was unaware of this, but he pointed out he, he, the exact number of, of individual uh, requirements that are stipulated in, in detailed IMF documentation. Uh, and uh, again, according to this particular individual, China is not that far off fulfilling many of them. Uh, and so, and this will be part of the great fun and games and interesting debates that are going to take place. It strikes me that uh, at least the PBOC thinks they have a clear timetable for doing some other things, for at least fulfilling the criteria to become part of the SDR basket. Whether that, what that really means is in itself very debatable, because of course the SDR is at least currently purely a, an accounting currency uh, for the IMF. Uh, but I know from various trips I've had to, uh, particularly Beijing, and, and, and speaking and meeting with China, some Chinese academics that I, that I know, some of which are quite influential, quite, quite a lot of Chinese policymakers believe that <clears throat> the SDR should be uh, a much more dominant uh, instrument at the core of the future monetary system in some sort of strange way the way I interpret it is they, they see the SDR potentially performing an anchor role in the same way perhaps that gold did uh, under the uh, fixed exchange rate system uh, back in the day. Uh, second thing to add in that regard, um, it seems to me some, something happened related to the crisis last August uh, when, when we had the, the double whammy of the S&P downgrade and, and the, the, budget, uh, the budget gridlock in Washington coinciding with the uh, elevation or escalation of the European financial crisis. My suspicion is that that scared Chinese policymakers into further worrying that they were, their, their future is too dependent on events elsewhere in the world. Uh, and so that allowed, again, bringing it back to the previous question, the reformers to, decide, to, to have some influence and say, the only way we can reduce that risk is by doing a number of things to, to have our own future destiny more determined by what goes on uh, internally. And to, in order to do that, we need to uh, reform our financial markets. Um, so that's how I would broadly yeah, right here, please, in the second row. Hi, uh, is this on? Yes, uh, Chris Kostiuk. Uh, I thought you had a very intriguing uh, chart about the debt levels between the U.S. and the, and the rest of the world. It, uh, if you uh, put in a variable for the ability to repay that debt, uh, in other words, uh, the resources that a country has and its markets and whatnot, how would you redo that, uh, that chart and how would the U.S compare versus some of the growth economies? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, let me go back to it. I, I, I put on the end of here, actually the growth environment scores for all the various countries too, which is broadly speaking how, how I would answer you. And specifically, I, I might have over interpreted into your question. The, the issue of natural resources, for example, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm sort of Dutch diseased, sympathetic person. I, I think there are, there are great dangers in exaggerating 
permanent benefits uh, of being well endowed with natural resources. Um, it always seems great when the prices are rising all the while, uh, but as we're seeing in a number uh, of highly um, important natural resource producers right now, uh, within the BRICS, Brazil included, uh, but certainly elsewhere, Australia is, uh, is, is trying to grapple with this issue. The, the risk of an increasingly um, diverse two-tier economy uh, is not to be uh, dismissed. Uh, and if, if in the event of something out there surprisingly happened that caused commodity prices to drop sharply, uh, Australia might not quite seem, at least for a while, uh, this, this lucky country that, that has become so fashionable to, to think about. So on, on the resource thing itself, we have always been against using that as one of the variables in our growth environment score mm. uh, because of the, the his, history of great volatility of commodity prices uh, and, and the fact that there is also a lot of evidence, not, not from those two countries per se, but in obviously parts of the Middle East and elsewhere, arguably Russia, being so well endowed in commodity resources actually makes policymakers lazy uh, in that they waste quite a lot of that wealth. Um, but my, so with that caveat, my broad answer would be in the context of, uh, of the growth environment score and, and bringing it back to the European crisis and, and, and why I was rude about the stability paths. The, ul the ultimate solution for, for European economic welfare irrelevant in some ways of what happens with European Monetary Union is doing things to boost their productivity and growth potential or raising their growth environment scores. Um, Greece has a, a lower growth environment score than Brazil and China, um, who are the two best of the BRICS. And, 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 and every time I, I hear myself say that, it makes me wonder, why, why was Greece allowed into the European Monetary Union so easily? Mm -hmm. um, and Greece has to do things, and may, maybe, by the way, it is because of the, ne never, let a, never let a crisis go to waste. Uh, maybe Greece is doing some, some of these things uh, that may, may boost its long-term growth performance. Uh, but in, in that context, uh, the US is in, uh, obviously, a, a much better position than many of the so-called blood-led countries. Okay, and one last question, right up here, Lincoln Ellis, please. Hi, uh, just on the heels of your highlighting uh, India's unenviable fiscal position, maybe you could comment uh, on India being put on negative watch uh, yesterday by... Uh, no, that was India put on negative watch. Uh, on, uh, by by S&P, uh, and then also if you could, uh, Chelsea or Bayern. <laughs> Oh, goodness me. Um, well, I'm not surprised that India has been put on there. I didn't know that they put on watches today. I'm not surprised. Um, if you look at this table, uh, the, the latest budget India had, uh, they missed an opportunity again to, to try and do something about uh, structural issues and, and better uh, macroeconomic policy control. Um, I, uh, India, in many ways, is the most ex for me, the most uh, stimulating of the BRIC countries to think about because it's just so confusing. Uh, and I, I can change my mind about India at least once a day, <laughs> particularly when I'm there. Um, but uh, they, they need, I think they have the weakest of the macro uh, economic policy framework of the four BRIC countries. Are. Um, and, and, and going back to an aspect of, which I didn't touch on with it, question about China. You know, this, this great old age debate that at this stage of development, is India's democracy as useful as, as, as many people are understandably proud of? Uh, many Indian uh, intellectual leaders uh, understandably uh, highlight the fact that they are the world's biggest democracy, but frequently it means they can't get anything done in contrast to our friends uh, in Beijing. Uh, and, and, and this coalition, I think, has really struggled on, the, on a number of fronts. Uh, I, I, I highlight in that regard, I, I remember 
being, I think I was in Israel, and I picked up the Financial Times the morning after I arrived, and there was a small story that Indian policymakers had suddenly, out of nowhere, finally decided to allow uh, foreign investment in, into Indian retailing. And within two days, they changed the mind. Uh, as for the football, mm -hmm. <coughs> <Bad. laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Jim O'Neill.